Amen. Guys, it's my favorite hymn by my favorite people, my favorite voices that I love to hear sing. Thank you guys so much for putting that together and for doing that uh, my last Sunday here. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. I want to spend a few minutes in 1 John chapter 3. It'll take me a moment to get there. But as you turn there, let me just confess to you that this has been one of the hardest sermons to prepare of any sermon that I've ever prepared. I mean, yeah, it's different this week. He, t- he never preaches with his coat off. I don't want it to distract anybody. What do you say after 14 years as the lead pastor in a pulpit at a church? What do you say on your last Sunday? I will confess to you that at least my temptation is to try to be impressive, to try to go out with a bang, to try to say something new or novel, to try to say something profound or clever, to say something that is eloquent and memorable. That's the temptation that I've been feeling this week. But I had the realization that if I have done my job any at all over the last 14 years, then surely there would not be anything really important that I've not already said. So I'm sure today that I will repeat some of those most important things. I want you to know that I have prayed and I have thought about what those most important things may be. If you've been around since 2009, if you were here from the beginning, then you know I came in the door saying, God loves broken and messed up people. That's the way we articulated the gospel in our context. And people flocked to that message. People were restored by that message. And people who did not feel accepted by God before felt very accepted and safe in this place. And we rejoiced. But the problem was people wanted to be accepted by God just as they were, which is true, but then they didn't want to have transformation and change. They weren't real interested in growing in their faith. So we added to our message. We began to say God loves broken and messed up people, but he loves us too much to leave us in our brokenness and our mess. That God wants his people to grow. And in order to help individuals know how to grow, we set out, remember, a clear and accessible path for people to follow. If you want to follow Jesus, it looks like following this path. And you'll recall, if you've been with us since 2014, that that path, each letter stands for something. P, you're to pray and be in the Word every day. A, attend on Sundays. T, take time to be in some kind of a small group because we think growth, moving the truth from your head down into your heart and out into your life happens best in that context. And then H, have a personal ministry. We set that out for individuals to grow in their faith. We begin to think about Okay, if that's what it looks like for an individual to follow Jesus, what does it look like for a church to do so? And the mission in action, back of the napkin drawing was born. You've seen it in the new members class. We built upon that path diagram. If we took a poll and you asked what I have said the very most, what you've heard me say the most number of times, I think many of you would probably say, and it is true, I have said more than 500 times in this pulpit the phrase, sin-stained lips of a foolish preacher. And I have prayed that over 500 times before preaching for myself and for you. And the reason I say that before I preach, every time I pray it privately and many times publicly, and the reason I say it is because every week as I prepare to preach, I hear the voice of the accuser. And I hear him say, really? You're going to get up and, and, and preach the good news of the gospel to these people? After the way you talk to your wife, after the way you have talked to your kids, after the way you have lived your life? 
And so that prayer for me has been a confession to God and to you that the perfect gospel that you are hearing comes from someone who is broken and messed up. That I confess that what you are hearing is coming through the sin-stained lips of a foolish preacher, and I acknowledge that. I can never live up to the words that I preach, ever. And you can't either. And that's why we need Jesus. And every week I've tried to point you to him. Because life is found in him alone. It may surprise you to know that sin-stained lips of a foolish preacher is not actually the phrase you have heard me say the most number of times. Over 600 times, I have said the phrase that you heard me say at the beginning of this sermon. Turn in your Bibles to. You see, no preacher has a better word than God's word. And this is a group of people who are committed to the Scripture. Praise God for that. So as I have prayed, and I have sought the Lord about what he would have me to say, I just want you to know, my biggest concern for this church, as I prayed, this is what God, I feel like, really impressed upon me. For people who want to grow in their faith, for people who are committed to the Scriptures, which this group of believers are both of those things, the temptation for them moving forward will be just to focus on what the Bible tells us to do. I know you want to grow. I know your commitment to the Scripture. Let me get a, can I have a Kleenex right there? I know your commitment to the Scripture, and I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, I want to have a Christian marriage, so just tell me what the Bible says about marriage, and I'll do it. I want to be a Christian parent. Just tell me what the Bible says, and I'll do it. I want to be a good Christian employer, an employee. Just tell me what the Bible says, and I will do it. And the temptation for you will be just to focus on what the Bible says to do. I understand that. And you could bring in somebody who will preach that way. You could bring in somebody who will preach. Remember that old three-point sermon we've talked about? Bible says to pray. Y'all aren't praying. Y'all need to pray more. You can bring in somebody who will preach that way, and they will be saying what the Bible says, because it does say that you should pray, and you probably ought to be praying more. Those are all true statements supported by the Scripture. I can imagine a preacher in the future being frustrated with you and saying, there is nothing wrong with what I said. I said true things. I said what the Bible says. Here's a verse next to each one of those things. But listen, this is subtle. There is nothing wrong with what we said. It's what was not said. Yes, you said true things, but you did not tell the whole truth. Where is the main message of the Bible in what we just said? Where is the good news of the gospel of grace? Where is Jesus in, Bible says to pray, y'all don't pray enough, you need to pray. Where is Jesus in that? One line, what is it the Lord would have me tell you today is this. Telling people what God says to do is not wrong in itself, and I hope you can finish it. It's wrong if it's by itself. It's not wrong to tell people what God says to do. In fact, it's the safe path. In grace, we want to tell people what they should be doing. It's not wrong to tell people what God says to do. It's wrong if that's all you say. Now, why is it wrong to only tell people what God says to do? Why must we get to the good news of the gospel? Why must we get people to Jesus? Why must we get to Jesus ourselves? I'm glad you asked that question. Four reasons why. Number one, if we only tell people what the Bible says to do, if that's all we say, we miss the main point of the Bible. Now, I want to be respectful of God's word this morning, and I don't want you to hear me saying anything disrespectful. 
The problem is not with the Bible, it's with our approach to it. You see, if you go to the Bible primarily to find out what to do, you will find that the Bible is not nearly as specific as what you want it to be. There are a lot of general principles that we find here, but there are very few specifics. Think about marriage that we talked about before. Am I supposed to keep the checkbook and write the bills, or is Lisa supposed to do that? The Bible doesn't say. Do I take care of all the outside stuff, and she can't? The Bible doesn't say. There are general principles. I'm to love her like Christ loved the church, to lay down my life for her. But the specifics you're just not going to find. Parenting. We have this baby. We had all these ideas about what I was going to be as a parent. Then I bring that baby home and that baby won't stop crying. And we ask the question, how long can I let my baby cry before I pick up? The Bible doesn't say. It doesn't give us answers to that question. In fact, a few years ago, we did a Sunday school class on parenting. And in our evaluation, one of the members of the session came and said, the big complaint about this class on parenting is it was just a bunch of general principles with not nearly enough specifics. And I said, praise God. Because the Bible, if we're standing up in a Sunday school class telling you what the Bible says, it's going to be general principles. Now, can we discuss in wisdom and in my experience maybe what this looks like played out? Of course we can. But you can't stand up and say, thus saith the Lord, if it's not in the Scriptures. That's called legalism. That's moralism. The Bible is just not as specific as we want it to be. In fact, I don't mean to be disrespectful. But if God really wanted to write a how-to book, he could have done a much better job than what we have here. And I don't say that to be critical of the Bible. I say that to say that it should dawn on us that this is not a how-to book. Because if God wanted to write one, it would be more specific than this. In fact, we just go to the parts of this that tell us what to do because we like those parts and we're really not sure what to do with the other parts. There are all these stories about people in here. And often we look to those people for examples of what to do. We'll say something like, be like David, a man after God's own heart. Be like David. You think David would say, be like David? <laughs> be like David. Well, except for that part about Bathsheba, right? Except for the conspiracy to murder her husband to cover up his adulterous affair. I mean, do we pick and choose what we're going to follow? If you really read this book and study it closely, the so-called heroes of the Bible are not very heroic. And that's by design. God is teaching us something. It shows us that the main point of the Bible is not just to tell people what to do. God's main point is something else. Consider, there is only one true hero in the Bible. And that's God, who is always coming to the rescue of broken and messed up people. That's God, who can take broken and messed up and unfaithful people and use them to accomplish his purposes in this world. It's mind-blowing when you think about it. But it gives us such great hope. Because if God can use broken and messed up people like the ones we read about in this book, that means God can use broken and messed up people like us. We can have hope that he can use unfaithful people like us to turn the world upside down. That also means something else. It means that we can acknowledge our brokenness to God and to one another and still believe that God can use us. In fact, those are a couple of symptoms I want to leave you with. If this church ever loses hope that God can use us, that might be a symptom that we're not focusing on the main message of the Bible. Or, if we lose our ability to confess sin to one another, as James 5 and verse 16 tells us that we should do, it may mean that we're not focusing on the main message of the Bible, that we've lost our focus, that we're not on message. Elders, listen to me here. This is very important. You must lead in this. That's 
your calling from God is to keep this church focused on the right thing. And as we're focused on the right thing, there is great hope in this place. And there is repentance in this place. And elders, you must lead in repenting. You must be the chief repenters. You must be first to admit that you're broken and messed up in front of the flock of God. That's why Paul, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, when he's talking to the Ephesian elders, he says to them, keep watch over yourselves and the flock over which God has made you overseers. You first and foremost keep watch over yourself. For the sin that is in you and then confess those things. Listen, my best moments in this pulpit were when I confessed sin and when I was broken over my sin. Not because my preaching was good, but because I was on message. Because I was focused on what the main message of the Bible is. The main message that God is the hero, that we're not the hero. That God loves broken and messed up people like me. That God uses broken and messed up people like me. Put your hope in God. I will let you down. Jesus will never let you down. And it's safe to confess sin in this place. When it is saturated with the message that God loves broken and messed up people and he uses broken and messed up people. And if we're not confessing sin or we lose hope, perhaps it's because we've got an off message. When we read the Bible rightly, God is the only hero. And he's always coming to the rescue of broken and messed up people that he loves. And Jesus is the clearest picture of God's love for us. Think about a verse like John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. His love is reflected in his giving the son. Or a verse like I ask you to turn to, 1 John 3 and verse 16. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us. Listen, the main point of the Bible is to show us the love of God for people who don't deserve it. That's the main point. And I want you to think about that with me. How can God convince you that he loves you, that he will protect you, that he will provide for you, even in your brokenness and and in your unfaithfulness? How can he convince you of that? And evidently his conclusion has been by telling you story after story of how he has loved and provided and protected so many other people over the centuries who are as broken and messed up as we are. Friends, the Bible is not primarily about what to do. It is primarily about a relationship with a loving father. And if we believe that... If we really believe that that is God's main message, then as the people of God and his ambassadors, that must be our main message as well. We cannot only tell people what the Bible says to do, or else we miss the main point of the whole Bible. And do you know what happens when we stay on message? I hope you can recite it in your sleep because I've said it many times. That if there really is a God who loves broken and messed up people, and I really begin to believe that, then what is the natural response in my heart? If I see God's love for me when I don't deserve it, that he was willing to give his son even when I was his enemy, what does that do to my heart? I can't help but love him back. Seeing God's love for us makes us love him back. 1 John 4 and verse 19, it may be on the same page. It says, we love God because he first loved us. And then Jesus tells us what happened when we begin to love God. What happens, Jesus says in John chapter 14 and verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will follow my commands. Do you hear what's happening there? 
Because when we see the love of God for us, we begin to love him back. And as our love grows for him, we begin to express our love by obeying him. God's main message is also his main method for making people grow and to be holy. Listen, that is the secret sauce. Somebody ask, are you going to tell us the secret sauce? Yes, that's the secret sauce. By focusing on the love of God for broken and messed up people, they will begin to do the things that the Bible calls them to do. That's the secret sauce. So obviously, number one, we cannot only tell people what the Bible says to do or we'll miss the main point of the Bible. Number two, if we only say what the Bible says to do without getting to Jesus, we're not getting to the very thing Jesus said the Bible's about. Think of a verse like John chapter 5. Jesus is talking to people who are experts in the scripture. People who love telling everybody what the Bible says to do. And Jesus looks at these people and he says, you diligently study the scriptures. Boy, that's us. We do that, don't we? You diligently study the scriptures because you think by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, Jesus said. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Jesus says all the scriptures about him. Think about Luke 24, down in verse 27, when he's walking on the road to Emmaus with those disciples, and we're told that beginning with Moses and the prophets, that he goes through all the scripture telling them what it said concerning himself. Jesus said that all the scripture testifies about him. So think about that with me. That means if we try to explain or apply a text without getting to Jesus, then we're not getting to the very thing that Jesus said that text is about. And we don't really fully understand the text, and it's not fully explained if we don't show its connection to Jesus. So if we only say what the Bible says to do without getting to Jesus, we're not getting to the very thing Jesus said the Bible's about. Number three, if we only tell people what the Bible says to do without getting to Jesus then we're leading people to a false, self-centered religion. Think about that with me. When If all you do is tell people what to do, and you do that as a steady diet, Sunday after Sunday, here's what the Bible says to do, then who are you really calling them to rely on? Who are you really calling them to place their trust in? If your message is the Bible says to pray, y'all aren't praying, y'all need to pray more. Who are you calling them to rely on and to trust in? Themselves. We would never say that theologically. I'm sure you'll bring somebody in here who says, oh no, I don't believe that it's the good things that save us. And they really don't. But if week after week all you feed God's people is a steady diet of here's what God says to do and here's the verse where it says it then you're sending the message that you are the answer to your problems, that you just need to be smarter, you need to work harder, you need to be more disciplined. And all those things are probably true. But Jesus is the only solution to your problem. Telling people to do something without getting to Jesus just promotes a self-centered religion instead of a Christ-centered one. All the other religions in the world tell us what we should do. And if all we do is tell folks what they should do without getting to Jesus, then then we're no different than, than Muslims in a mosque or Jewish people in a synagogue. Because they tell people what to do too. They think you ought to pray too. It's the good news of the gospel. It's being Christ-centered that makes us different than the people around us. And when we only emphasize what to do, here's some more symptoms for you. It only leads us to one of two places. For people who are more introverted, they're more introspective, people who are more onto themselves, that steady diet just leads them to self-pity. They just hear week after week about what the Bible says to do that they're not doing, and they just fall into a pit of despair. And they either quietly slip away, or they're married to somebody who's like me, the other person, and they just get real quiet and don't say anything. The other place this leads is not to self-pity, but for people who are more extroverted, for people who are more focused on external things like I am, It leads to self-righteousness. The rich young ruler, right? I've done all these things since my youth. 
I, I'm praying every day. I'm attending on Sundays. I'm taking time to be in the community group. <laughs> Why can't you? It's the very spirit of self-righteousness. Take a passage of scripture like Titus 3. Notice the order that we get here. In Titus 3, beginning in verse 4, we read, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. So it's not the good things we do that make us acceptable to God. But according to his own mercy. And then he explains how the gospel works. By the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by his grace we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Look at verse 8. He says this saying is trustworthy. What saying? This recitation of the gospel that we just went through in verses 4 through 7. He says, this saying is trustworthy, and I want you to stress these things. He's saying, Titus on the island of Crete, with that, with, at that church, with that group of people, stress these things, the gospel. The, the King James Version says that we are to affirm constantly these things. Why? So that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. Do you see the order? First, the kindness and love of God toward people who don't deserve it. Then the response by people who believe in God, which is to do good works. There it is, Titus 3. The Bible never tells us what to do without first reminding us of what is true. For my grammar folks out there, I'll say it the same way. That the imperative, the commands, always are based on the indicative, what is true, and the order is not reversible. That's straight out of Ritterboss, the Dutch theologian. We've learned to say it here like this. We've said when we look at the Bible, we're going to talk about what is true and what to do. Don't lose your grip on that. Number four. If we only say what the Bible says to do without getting to Jesus, we're not connecting people to the only power to do the things the Bible calls us to do. You do know that on our own, we can't do the things that are in this book. We can't. Jesus said it, John 15 and verse 5, he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, you can bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. That's why the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 6 and verse 10, to be strong in the power of his might. So if we only tell people what the Bible says to do without connecting them to Jesus, we're not connecting them to the only power that there is to do the things that the Bible calls us to do. Let me close. Thought long and hard about the closing. How do you stick the landing, right? 14 years of preaching in three sentences. You ready? Number one, do not lose your focus on the good news of the gospel. Number two, everything in the Christian life flows from that message that God loves broken and messed up people, but he loves us too much to leave us in our brokenness and our mess. Number three, I call you. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Let's pray and ask God to help us do that. Let's pray. Oh, God, thank you for this group of people here at Redeemer Church. I thank you for their commitment to the Scripture. I thank you for their faithfulness and their desire to want to walk in your ways. I pray that you would enable them to never lose their grip on the gospel, to never lose focus. I pray for the leaders of this church. I ask your blessings on them, that you would give them wisdom and stamina in this transition that you would raise up the right next leader in this place, and that you would continue to advance the kingdom here in the shoals and use this church to do more than we could ever ask or imagine. All for your glory and for our good. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.